Florian Pou, and uh, he's a senior scientist from the University of Liege. Uh, he's a mentor in data sciences and machine learning and spearheads innovation for French Tech 120. He holds an award-winning PhD in sciences and was decorated with the 2019 ISPRS Jack Dangerman Award. And so today um, he's going to be presenting um, the first of possibly two um, presentations um, and uh, speaking about creating a voxel structure for 3D point cloud processing with Python. So uh, thanks for joining us, Florin, and uh, over to you. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Jack, for the kind words. So we'll share the um, share this. Uh, yeah, should be a little icon at the top right. Um, saying share. Yeah, there we go. Working. That that's perfect. Yeah, nice full screen. Okay, take it away. Thanks. All right. Thanks all for joining. Um, Having the skills and, and the knowledge, you know, to attack every aspect of point cloud processing opens up a lot of R&D doors and it's like a toolbox for uh, 3D research creativity and development agility. And at the core, uh, there is this marvelous field that studied data structuration to better organize, uh, manage, to enable efficient access, uh, modification, inference, um, a lot of uh, different tasks. And if we dive deeper within this core aspect of point cloud processing, we find the voxel uh, structure. Um, it, it's, it's actually a cool name, but how can voxel expand our three data processing quiver? And how and what is actually a voxel structure? Well, uh, let me present uh, the story of this underestimated tiny blocks that can do a lot uh, in research. So you see, um, I'm uh, how could we describe that? Oh, sorry, I, I lost the feed here yeah, for some reason. Yeah, I'm a big point cloud enthusiast and I first discovered the existing 10 years ago. And uh, since then, I have been tweaking my practices uh, through evolution of reality capture to always get sharper data sets. But I still remember my first surveys uh, with terrestrial laser scanner and drones and quickly getting this amazing, still amazing 3D point cloud. But then you are a bit confronted to the reality and how should we consider this entities? At that time, the processing was uh, heavily manual, you had a lot of repetitive digitization and you had uh, steps like filtering, uh, registration, cleaning, segmentation, classification, meshing and, and so on. Uh, it evolves for some part, many registration, filtering and meshing, but the main uh, bottleneck that uh, is automation is still uh, massive. And um, what is, um, sorry, I have troubles with the presentation for some reason. Um, uh, so here we will tackle in this first step, the 3D perception and automation. And to, to make a small parallel, I like uh, in 1980, Traceman defined in simple terms the complex mechanism behind our human side perception that leads us to make a parallel to 3D perception. And it is often, let's say, like um, this perception, visual perception, is often the primary source uh, of information which our cognitive decision system can use to act on. And it's extendable with your brain that will uh, quickly adapt to new surroundings and uh, only use the most important material captured through your eyes. If we simplify, the brain will capture around three images every second, which are sorted, combined with prior knowledge to create the reality we experience. And when we know that, uh, with two days computational power and high level of dematerialization, virtually replicating such a process is uh, very attractive uh, but seems feasible. While the operation is generally hard to mimic, studying how we interact with our world um, environment permit to better grasp boundaries and uh, usable mechanism. And that's what we will um, check out. So if we take, uh, let's say, a classical um, 
For example, if we want to mimic this visual perception system, we have these three steps that we, we, we do with our tools. So we have the real world and we have some digitization technique. Using laser scanner, drones, you name it. And we obtain this low level digital model, which is mainly geometric. And what we try to do a lot uh, in these last years is trying to incorporate semantics and, and other transformation to get a high level digital model that is much closer to the semantic representation that we need to have um, automatic process and inferences and to be able to use that for interpretation tasks. Right. So, um, the, the, of course, the, the big struggle I named it is automation. And if we take a classical progressing ring through this uh, seven step on the left, uh, we see that there are any effort in all of these steps. So the first one is acquisition, of course, and trying to have a system that can automatically gather data without going on the field, for example. The second step will be pre-processing. Uh, in this example is uh, having uh, tools that allows, for example, to filter the noise and only uh, keep the relevant points in a point cloud. Then we have the registration. The main idea is trying to put all the data sets in one frame of reference. So here we see two uh, viewpoints from the uh, same scene and we try to merge that in, in the same uh, frame of reference. But of course, that extends to fusing uh, data, to having multi sensors, uh, uh, point clouds, and so on. So there is a lot of active research as well there. Segmentation, that's maybe where I'm uh, the most active. Um, and here, the idea is not typically to directly go to the uh, to pointing the, the, the clear semantics, but rather to try to have a low level grouping of points that makes sense enough for the lowest level application. And then if this segmentation is well done, we could use it, for example, to group segments and have uh, classes, which uh, today we have two terms within classification. We have semantic segmentation and instance segmentation, which both uh, will, uh, will actually uh, be part of uh, classification with our taxonomy in remote sensing. And one task, which is, uh, Underestimated, which is uh, the hidden part of the iceberg, is usually structuration. Uh, to allow all of this to happen, um, we really need to focus on uh, structuration, modeling, uh, so tasks that would make uh, the data much more efficient to process, much handier to manipulate, and uh, allows, for example, to go in a real time direction or uh, to have some capabilities to extract features. Uh, in, a, in a short time frame, things like this. And lastly, uh, we have the, the, the applications. So here, really, what I want to illustrate is that uh, that is the classical way surveyors will make a facade elevation plan, a floor plan that we draw on a point cloud. But of course, if we had a way to have that in an autonomous matter, that would be really uh, Really interesting. So you see there, there are lots already of research opportunities uh, uh, if we take this uh, seven classical steps of that process. But before moving on to uh, the second part of this talk, I want to, to just highlight a, a short thing here. It's uh, about automation. You see, I talked a bit about this low level grouping with segmentation. Well, sometimes we actually see that uh, it could be counterintuitive uh, this segmentation as for this specific um, application where we wanted to have uh, a very low level modeling uh, done in automatic fashion. The first, let's say, the, the, the first intuition would have been to detect the element that are closest to our concepts. So for example, the full roof or the full building or the full ground or the full tree. But if we want to target modeling, then it makes sense to go much uh, deeper and have much lower uh, segments. And that's what was done with this uh, work here. So you see, sometimes we need this counterintuitive uh, that will balance the, the, the first intuition we have when uh, doing research. OK, so that, that's the global introduction. We see that we are uh, in a way trying to mimic this uh, 
perception uh, that we have as humans, which is marvelous. It's very hard. There are a lot of things to do. We are uh, absolutely not there, but uh, the research direction and uh, to, to today context in research make it possible to, to, to do very cool things. And here already uh, we saw a lot uh, with point cloud, but let's approach how uh, to represent 3D data. And that's where we have a card down our sleeve. While the 3D data sets in our computerized ecosystem, um, and today a lot of this data set comes from reality capture devices. They are found um, in different forms that vary both in the structure and the properties. And what is interesting why I show that is that they can somehow be mapped with success to point clouds, uh, thanks to the canonical nature of point clouds. And uh, we will focus uh, today on one of them, which is the 3D voxel representation, which is a really fun one. And you can see it's the third one starting from the left. It's the one that uh, looks uh, with tiny blocks assembly. The one on the left is a feature-based visualization. The second one is the point cloud with color mapped onto it. And the last one is the boundary representation. So. Um, interestingly, um, as I said, they, they can be mapped to point cloud, and here you have a small extract from a very nice paper that I recommend you to, to take a read in if you're interested into the voxel evolution in the construction industry by Xu uh, and And uh, you see that it summarizes more or less the pros and cons of each uh, data uh, type or data structure, where you have point cloud if you can have it as a 1D list, where you have a detailed description, accurate measures for each point. But the problem with point cloud is unstructured. It has not a homogeneous density. Uh, the depth map here, you have mostly a 2.5D description. And the 3D mesh, uh, it could be difficult to process and edit or sensitive to noise. Whereas the voxel grid, it may not be as accurate as point cloud, but um, you have this structured data, which is really rich, flexible with the 3D description. And uh, that is what we are interested in in this session. And now we'll maybe take a bit of a step back. Um, if in your childhood, you, you played a bit with Lego. And uh, today, I think Minecraft uh, will be the equivalent on our computers. Then it will not be too hard to correct you. Uh, if you remember how fun it is to assemble these uh, tiny blocks to form 3D representation, we then use that as a child to have fun, uh, sure, but to create stories, uh, simulate uh, favorite movie and so on. And it's very, very cool because uh, with Voxel, you can expand that outside of fun. You can still have fun with them, but you can actually address uh, real problems, real challenges uh, that we will speak a bit about uh, in them. Uh, some more future slides, right? So that is uh, very, very cool. But what is the, the, the linked, uh, the actual link with the current voxel? So simply put, voxels, I guess most of you are familiar with, but just in one slide, they have this uh, 3D analog of uh, 2D pixel. Some say 3D pixel, but doesn't sound a bit weird. Uh, it is a simple way to structure a 3D data set uh, that is an order uh, initially, like point clouds, for example, and you get this assembly of uh, primitive blocks that can easily be linked to the Lego assembly that I talked about. Uh, the primary difference with this uh, one is, apart from the physical, I guess, the digital properties, is that the voxel only play with one type of base element, which is a cube, whereas the Legos, you can play with various pieces, with various dimensions, and so on. But if we adopt already at this step a uh, multi scale vision and reason theoretically, we could uh, actually go in this direction. And voxel are uh, really a very nice modeling technique for replicating reality and can go far behind, beyond, sorry, uh, what we, we, we take them uh, for. So, point clouds uh, that you see here, it's um, it's a small uh, rendering of a uh, topographic uh, course with uh, students where they learn how to, um, you know, implant a building or it was a pool in Belgium. It's very important to have a pool uh, in the shadow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, here, what I want to illustrate rather than this is that the point cloud is not perfect. 
right? Uh, and you can see here you have uneven densities, you have uh, occlusions, you have a lot of things like this, you have unstructured uh, discrete points, uh, you have many, many problems that uh, will not be necessarily directly solved with Voxel, but which make it a bit hard to uh, grasp for the non-initiated uh, user. So uh, really uh, another thing that I want to to emphasize here is uh, like uh, to the images, the, the, the point cloud are usually unstructured. So they don't have semantic or really low semantic uh, geometric or topological information about objects. In this scene, everything is a point and we don't have really uh, links to the surrounding points, except if we do some processing. For this, we need a data structure. And this lack of an adequate data structure is the main bottleneck for the pre-processing or the processing for a further application of uh, this raw point cloud. That's generally necessary to organize and structure this uh, three points into a higher level representation, such as voxel assemblies. And these four uh, challenges um, are actually tackled somehow with uh, uh, voxel uh, structuration, right? And I think it's uh, time that we dive now into 3 voxel for point cloud processing. So let's see. Yeah, the first element that I want to talk is before we use point cloud in any application, as I said before, it is recommended to organize the raw point cloud into a data structure. Um, and here the data structure regards a process through which the measured point can be stored um, and the range in memory space or as file, which can be easily used and manipulated in targeted application. I just want to point out that, that uh, the data structure is not only related to memory or files, but organized data, but can be also a database schema or searching a database management system. And uh, here what I illustrate is that um, organizing this point with a certain data structure is a necessary uh, and effective way to perform various operations related to data processing. And a good data structure should be designed to organize point clouds to suit a specific purpose uh, as, general, as generalizable as possible to um, access and perform in a certain manner some processing uh, task on it. And here you, you see that, for example, <clears throat> inserting a point cloud in a database management system it's too unstructured and too sparse to have uh, for each row a point you will explore the, the system so you have some techniques like a block storage model where you will try to group points uh, into this block uh, tiny blocks and, and then make it possible to manage your point cloud in a, in a, in a database right so i just wanted to quickly um address this uh, thing which seems important at uh, these steps. And recently, the voxel-based representation have been frequently reported uh, in a wide variety of point cloud applications showing great potential and value. And there are three main elements that uh, makes them a very good way to attack point cloud processing. So first is the ability to encode rich attribute the information that voxel can store and represent is better than when simply using spatial volume and coordinates. In particular, uh, the voxel will create a 3D space uh, limited by a given size, and uh, it will inherit the attributes, so it can inherit the attributes of the included points, such as the RGB, the colors, the intensity, the semantics, you name it. And for the description of spatial topology, um, that's the second point it's super uh, useful so expliciting this description because with point we don't have this information with voxel we can have uh, a structure similarly to pixel uh, where the position and the neighboring relation for voxel are fixed in this uh, three degree or a tree structure and then if we index uh, the node of the cell of this tree uh, we can solve the adjacency and the inclusion of topology of each voxel during the division of the 3D space. 
and that makes a lot of application uh, targetable then later on uh, because we have this uh, very strong notion. But of course, CC knows a lot about this. So uh, <laughs> at the UNS uh, uh, view, you are uh, in very good hands. Therefore, when traversing voxel or retrieving the neighboring of a voxel, there is no need, for example, with that to calculate and recover the spatial coordinate of uh, the full uh, voxel um, uh, full voxel space. Instead, we get the adjacency of the topology can be directly inferred from the voxel index. And then the third step is this ability to have a flexible representation and level of detail um, that makes it possible to play on uh, different um, level. Well, it's it's the term, and based on this trait, we can create voxel with different levels of resolution and. Here I, I can mention the octree structure that can hold this uh, for, for, for voxels at different levels and uh, allows us to target much more efficiently uh, search traversal, for example, or things like this. And then, of course, uh, you have on the right side an extract again from this uh, very nice uh, paper uh, where you see in the last 10 years or so, some example of uh, application of this voxel based point cloud uh, um, usage. And there are four families that are targeted that are linked to what I explained with the seven classical steps before. The first one is pre processing. And here you have an example of uh, having a flexible and elastic wireframe, which will allow a better estimation of uh, element down the line. You have the segmentation and classification step where voxel are very useful to uh, add, for example, additional information like topology uh, or encoding uh, much stronger or localized uh, attributes, like we said before, that allows some uh, models, machine learning, deep learning to better um, perform. Then you have uh, at the registration and the change detection step, it's very important here. Uh, we have some way to do, for example, some change detection point to point. But here, when you have the ability uh, to put on top or to use, depends how you see it, to use a voxel grid, then you will be able to discretize the space and localize changes in a bounding volume and or uh, have a registration which may be more, much more uh, accurate. And lastly, we have this modeling and reconstruction step where uh, voxels are very uh, useful for uh, extracting some, let's say, um, representation that could be well integrated into current workflows like flow plan or beam models or uh, things like this, which builds on voxel uh, extraction. Right. OK, so. Um, I will go through this uh, different uh, elements and the first one is the uh, pre-processing. So here, as uh, we just explained uh, quickly before, what is interesting is that um, you have the ability in pre-processing to do some special filtering with uh, voxel, so removing amplier and noise. Um, you can refine the data, so resample 3D surfaces and have a better refinement of points. You can do some data compression. And here, for example, point cloud compression. You can simplify <clears throat> the data, so selecting on a key point, or you can generate new uh, data. So that's only a very few samples of what you can see in the literature that build on uh, voxel assemblies or using voxels. So here it's just a way to, 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 to provide uh, with uh, concrete application in research or in uh, the industry that make use already of voxels. And as you can see, there are already a lot of uh, applications that benefit from that. The second family, so segmentation and classification, um, again, I selected five steps. So you have the first step where you want to extract a primitive, uh, like segmentation of planar and planar structure. A voxel plays a, a very good role, again, because on top of having this uh, very structured, uh, let's say, grid-like space, you can infer the relationship, the topology with surrounding voxels, and that will uh, give a lot of uh, power to your uh, segment, primitive extraction segmentation 
workflow. A same labeling is extending that, but having this semantic concept. So same thing, you have a, a lot of work done using voxel, object detection, feature learning. Uh, again, we talked a bit about it before, but voxel are very interesting if you want to uh, explore this direction. And skeletonization or a relationship and topology injection, that's of course a very good way to have such uh, element extracted. On the third uh, family, so registration and change detection, here, um, well, data alignment, so aligning uh, several data sets in one frame of reference, that is very useful. There are some uh, very interesting work that make use of Voxel. Uh, change detection, I talked a bit about it before. Data fusion, uh, if you want to fuse multi-source data, that's gives, let's say, an objective way of uh, trying to see how we will handle uh, differences in uh, resolutions, for example, differences in uh, precision. And uh, for recasting, that's uh, force box grids are well used uh, for real-time application or if you want to make some simulation using recasting. Lastly, we have the modeling and reconstruction, where here, um, I, I, I summarized the five family, but the two last one could be included into three space analysis. Well, the first thing is, of course, you can uh, tag then volumetric reconstruction. So not only modeling the boundary, uh, like we do, because when we acquire point cloud, we have only the surface which is scattered, or at least with our reality capture devices. But if you want to really describe what is within, so to know if uh, what is behind the surface of the wall, so behind the paint, um, then we could use voxel to have this information. Then model reconstruction, you can turn your voxel into a 3D object or to model the complete scene. Uh, 3D spatial analysis, we see uh, some very interesting work where you make use of this uh, topology extracted and uh, model a specific field of application. And for example, based on this, you will have some simulations uh, available, playing on visualization and representation, or what is really cool as well is integrating the physics because most um, um, implementation of physics uh, motor based you know, nowadays on, on, on different libraries or different paradigms, and uh, the incorporation of physical really plays well with voxels. That's also a direction that can be uh, um, how to, how to say explore. So now that you see why it's uh, very, very uh, useful and uh, why this, um, let's say, tiny uh, little step into the full point cloud processing um, ecosystem, uh, I think it's important to, uh, here I, I targeted for starting or at least to have uh, the, the, the tool and the knowledge to be able to build uh, from you on without uh, limiting your creativity, that's the goal. Uh, then um, I, I will give you some direction that will target each of these uh, family aspects. Um, and, and the first one here is, uh, of course, I, I want to give the tools, the tutorial and the direction to get started. Uh, we not have the time really to deep dive into the code uh, for this session, but that can be something maybe uh, later on if uh, needed. Uh, I will. I took the direction to focus on uh, Python for 3D uh, data because uh, nowadays it's, it's a very uh, well, well known language, not very hard to get started with. And most of you may already be aware or already use Python uh, and it's very well integrated with the uh, rapid evolving deep learning uh, area. So that's why it's, it, it would be a good choice. And uh, what I try to do usually is I try to take a minimal amount of library because, uh, you know, things evolve rapidly. And if you use in your project I don't know, 100 different libraries, uh, then managing the conflicts can be a bit time consuming when you want to uh, get into a new version of Python, you change your environment or things like this. And uh, uh, the last point that I <clears throat> emphasize is I want to have the lowest possible view uh, to keep your scientific creativity intact. So really, I want to ensure that all the, the, the founding block uh, allows you to have this tool set where you don't feel limited and you know what exists. But then it will be up to you to uh, 
to have these uh, really uh, crazy ideas to explore the dual use voxels. Right, okay. So uh, the first step for the Python part, uh, Python preparation. Um, so a small point on this uh, next slide. Uh, I can make it available because uh, I made a short time to uh, give all the most direct links to the resources that I give. So every article is referenced. If you click on it, you go directly on the article. Uh, same thing for the tutorials here. Uh, so that it's very easy for you if you follow through to know exactly uh, what you need and at uh, which step. So the first thing, of course, before running into uh, implementation of your research ID is uh, preparing your first environment. So how and with what will you code? Uh, here, it's really up to you. Today, you have a lot of possibilities. If you want to rapidly prototype something, then a Jupyter notebook are a good solution. And if you want to keep track of the results, um, it's a well-used uh, solution. The, the, the equivalent on the web, the most known one, I don't want to advertise anything here, but the most known one is uh, Google Colab, but you have, of course, other uh, possibilities. Um, but th th this one may be the, the, the most used. And after, if you like to have a full IDE, um, then you have PyCharm or Spider, that are two uh, very, uh, very nice environments. My preference go for Spider, but PyCharm is actually maybe as uh, for some part better features. So if you like to have one a place where you do everything, that would be a good place to, to start with. And then when you, you chose your environment, you set up uh, everything, maybe using Anaconda, maybe not. You, you can install libraries needed. Um, I put down six main 3D libraries. Usually I will rely mostly on Open3D and PyTorch 3D. The other one, uh, PDL for some projects, it's really good. Cool, it's the equivalent of, of Chile, but for point cloud data. Uh, but I will limit myself for, to this and the other one, I just uh, keep a, an eye on it for, for the evolution. But again, I don't want to, uh, to make an advertisement for any of them. They are all super great ways to, uh, to get started or to build an expertise with point cloud. So it's very nice if you know at least that they exist. And um, what I usually do is I try to stay as low level as possible. So NumPy is, a, is a maybe the best library when uh, dealing with uh, numerical operation. So if something is very long to implement, I will use the best uh, library available. But if I know I need some performances, I will stick with NumPy uh, usually. And after that, of course, you need to have a data set ready. And uh, that may not be as simple as just writing, preparing the data set, uh, depending on which field of application you are in, if you're a researcher, and what you are tackling, especially with point cloud data. And you can extend that to Voxel, of course. But uh, today, the, the landscape of uh, let's say uh, classified point clouds, it's not very big or not as big as images, for example, it's starting to get bigger, but um, you may need for, especially for a specific application to create your own uh, uh, labels. Now you, you can have some tools that help you do that. And it's, it's very uh, time consuming and you, you need a bit of expertise to do that. So you cannot outsource labeling to, um, companies as easily as you could outsource, for example, the labeling of images, right? Okay, so for all of this elements, if you don't feel comfortable with what I, uh, I spoke about, uh, you have on, on the right side uh, five ways. Uh, the first one is a, a crash course that has everything given step by step. So here you just need that follow through and at the end, you are fully ready plus attacking uh, uh, things like semantic segmentation and so on. But if you want to stay here uh, with more uh, flexibility, you have these four tutorials uh, openly available. Uh, if you cannot reach them, just please uh, send me an email and I will check, but normally they are fully available to everyone. Uh, the first one is deep over uh, 3D point cloud processing with Python. So here it's really the first steps. Then the second one will dive into meshing. Um, 
all these tutorials usually take 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, if you if, if you are in a calm environment, you already have everything ready to go, you can come along. The third one gives you some uh, LIDAR data set for the driving car. Uh, and the last one gives you tools to uh, do some visualization uh, within uh, Python and also to put some interaction if you want to build an interactive app that would be a, a good place also to explore. So as I said, um, I could not uh, uh, like dive deep into the code into this one hour session. Uh, but if you, you you want to build this uh, first hand knowledge, then please you, you can explore that. And of course, uh, if you are a university student, the first reflex is to listen to your Officer and the theory behind, which is maybe the first uh, funding block uh, if you don't understand really uh, one or the other aspect. All right, so now on the uh, pre processing um, part uh, here, you have this, um, this tutorial as well that I created, which is specifically linked to automating LIDAR point cloud processing with Python. And here, um, what I show is actually using only uh, NumPy and a way to, to let's say, implement the, the voxel grid so that you have a, a lot of hands on what you want to store within. Because if you will use a library like Open3D that I will show later on, it must be much quicker to get to this uh, voxel, but you, not, you may not have the hands on what you want to input for each voxel. And if you're doing research, if you want to really have a hand on I don't know, feature, uh, feature um, compression or extracting thing or compression element. So it's better to, to go in this direction. So here, you also have a lot of literature that will give you the main aspect of how to best build uh, the algorithmic side of your uh, voxel structure. And you can extend that with having a, a knock tree uh, a knock tree that will encompass at the lowest level the, 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 the fox set structure. But uh, some direction are, I remember that CC, you wrote uh, an article some years ago where you give exactly the algorithmic view on how to build a knock tree structure and, 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 and voxelization. So if you are at the UNSW course, you have a great one there, but you have on the web a lot of um, um, let's say that uh, courses or things that will give you exactly the path to do that. The implementation is up to you, and every implementation will vary for sure. Uh, so here on the right, I just wanted to highlight three things. Um, for example, in, in, in this stack here, you will need first to initialize the number of voxel to fill uh, the initial space. So basically, the first input is the bounding box of your point cloud. And based on that, you will know exactly how, how many voxels you want to fill that space. Some voxels will be empty, some voxels will be filled with points. But at this step, you, you index mostly everything. And uh, already at this step, there is one interesting thing, uh, is that you will need to define a parameter. Parameter is the voxel size. And you have different ways of parameterizing this voxel size. And the Let's say the objective here will be to to be as um, out of application as possible, so have, to have something generalizable, so a heuristic or, or some way to compute this uh, sizing automatically. Uh, that, that is something that, that, that would be super great. Then once you have this, you compute the non-empty voxel and you keep trace of indexes so that we can relate to the point without keeping them in the processing field. So that means that here already uh, you, you you will store only the field voxel and you don't need to store, for example, the empty voxel. You could, but you don't need to. Uh, and you can always get them with a subtraction of the full space. You subtract the, the full voxel and you will have the empty voxel. And that's also a very nice thing with having the structured data set. It's so, it gives so, well, it simplifies a lot. <laughs> Uh, the, the way we approach uh, processing, uh, especially point cloud, because else it could be uh, much more uh, complicated. Um, and then, of course, after we also do some 
sum and count the point in each voxel. If we want, we can do at this step some more specific uh, processing. So for each voxel, you could compute some features. Uh, you could uh, extract the topological graph and, and things like this. And then once you have this, after you can create a loop over all those non-empty voxel to store uh, each in this as keys in a dictionary. So that's a way of uh, different ways. Uh, store the related points as the value of each key, and then you can compute, for example, the very center of each voxel and have a list that will only have the very center. Or you could compute uh, the voxel closest point to the very center. And there's four uh, direction where in the scope of pre-processing with this article to, to have a bridge sampling, for example. And then all that is left for you to do is visualize and automate uh, as much as possible to uh, have something really uh, useful and that can be used by other people. Um, the logo here is the collab logo. And if you click on it, you will directly go on the code uh, for this article. Great, so that is an example for pre-processing where you will have the tools, uh, if you follow that, will be equipped. Then on the segmentation and classification, here I wanted to illustrate another um, open access article um, written with Roland uh, Bilen in 2019, where here the goal was basically to have a semantic segmentation of a scene and on top of an instant segmentation. And for that, um, I took the direction to use voxels to extract the topology and here uh, especially to understand the neighboring relationships for each voxel. And it was it was a low supervision because you you for each voxel you only were tagged if this voxel is planar, if it's on the edge, uh, if it's uh, somewhere else. And depending on this uh, semantic pointer, then we could structure and segment the point clouds in a way that uh, make it very, uh, uh, very useful for the semantic segmentation later on. And, and that was, uh, or that shined a lot of light on how powerful they, they are at extracting, uh, especially for point cloud, there's uh, relationships consideration. Very, very useful. And, um, one thing also that was a light is, of course, we need to, to pay attention to the varying densities of point cloud. So, of course, if you have a fixed voxel size, you will be really sensitive to uh, low level densities uh, or parts of the scene where you don't have a lot of densities. So, in that case, it was really interesting to explore the multi, uh, multi scale approach where, depending on the densities, you could adjust the size of the voxel if you were using an orthogonality structure. So here you have a way to uh, get started if you want to go in this direction and uh, use box. Uh, another step is um, the registration and change detection. So here I'm still in the process of uh, uh, writing at my uh, uh, yeah late night uh, when I have sometimes uh, another tutorials. So I should be ready uh, by the end of next month that will target specifically uh, change detection. But you have some uh, example into this uh, point cloud processing online course, of course, that targets in, uh, with really uh, a lot of details this step. And on the right, you have an article again by uh, Mr. Pirung and uh, Yves Thiele that also wrote the article, the review uh, part of the author. Uh, that was in 2018, and that's just to show that you could use the voxel-based metadata structure for change detection in point clouds of large-scale urban areas. So it's a very nice article. I encourage you to read it uh, if you didn't yet. That highlights one way of using voxel for change detection. And lastly, you have the modeling and reconstruction family. And here again, you have the possibility to uh, Follow this uh, tutorial on how to automate voxel modeling of 3D point cloud with Python. Here, the idea was just to uh, give the possibility to um, use um, point clouds as 3D voxel assemblies that are turned into uh, mesh models. So <laughs> it's a dirty trick, but that makes it at the end possible to use your point cloud as 
boxer assembly as mesh actually into uh, I don't know um, game engines for example that don't support so well point cloud or if you want to yeah you, you, you may have the, the best intuition about where you will use that uh, in in that case we also need to extract the volume of each element or if you want uh, to have something uh, solid to work on or things like this and uh, on the right i just give you the translation of what uh, that is with a library like open 3d you can see that in as little as I didn't count, but you have less than 20 lines of code, you can transform very easily your point cloud into a mesh. And then, of course, that is the first step, because uh, if you want to play on this aliasing effect, you will have to, uh, you know, to tweak your mesh so that you will follow uh, or the, the, the voxel assembly so that you will follow really the, the geometry of the underlying point cloud. But yeah, it's it's uh, today um, it's very good to know that the tools are there to really focus much more on the research area that needs a lot of uh, uh, very great uh, bright mind and great ideas, and uh, it's good to have that at least available somewhere. And again, here you have the code, so feel free to use that uh, in your own project. Great, and now I will dive a bit into. Uh, Let's say the future perspective now that we saw the real context so the perception and why automation is such a hard task to tackle. We saw that we have the luck to be able to play on different data representation, not only point cloud. Uh, here we focus on voxel, but you have other ways as well. We saw how voxel are used in point cloud processing uh, today, and we saw a concrete example, and then we so together uh, all the tutorials, all the content, all the code that is available to you uh, to be usable right after the presentation if you want uh, and start building a really great project. And now what is left is looking at the future. So the first thing is, of course, I always like to have in mind uh, something short term compared to when we do research, uh, we try to attack things that will be problems in five, 10 years, maybe more. Um, but it's also fun sometimes to have projects or research that can translate in a short time frame, so within five years, into a, an innovation. And especially with a grid, I think uh, that that's one of the keywords. Innovation means trying to take the research and develop it in a way it's useful to everyone. So have something uh, that extends the proof of concept. And I went on this venture now more than uh, eight years ago uh, with uh, this uh, data platform that you can uh, put point clouds in and have uh, a lot of functionalities. And I intend this year with the team to release a, a full open platform for every researcher and the education, of course, um, to be able to have this labeling services where you have the, the upload your point clouds, you upload things, and it's very easy then down the line with unsupervised schemes to uh, directly label your point cloud to extract relationship uh, and things like this. And we are at the moment trying to also open with uh, API to development that you may want or you may need so that you can. Uh, also use that for your own uh, research uh, task apart from the data set constitution. So that's one way uh, uh, research uh, is, uh, and especially research with Voxel is very important, but of course uh, there you will run into development problematics uh, that you do not possibly have when you're doing research and you try to escape the scope of uh, efficient implementation, for example. In this case, you need things like this. Um, the second thing that I want to highlight is, of course, the literary trends. And here that's an extract from the paper 3D Point Cloud Data Processing with Machine Learning for Construction and Infrastructure Application by Mirzai Eal uh, this year. And you can see all the keywords um, that we find in the papers. So Point Cloud is at the center, segmentation, object detection, LiDAR, deep learning, of course. Uh, Progress monitoring, that's more for the construction, machine learning classification, photogrammetry, 
uh, does uh, the, whether it's registration or network clustering, damage detection. I do not see voxel, but uh, it's within point cloud, let's say. <laughs> but that's all the that, that just to say that there is a lot of uh, uh, which is a really good motivation to go into this field and to try to, to add your uh, tiny block to the overall uh, research scope around Plenty. Now, we saw how to deal with voxels, but there is one thing is we usually, when we speak about data representation or 3D data representation, specifically geometric data representation, we may be at the object level, but we usually will describe a scene. And in this case, we have also the ability to play on different data representation for each object of the scene or for different parts of the object or things like this, which mean that in your scene, um, it's very cool to know that you can have hybrid ways of representing a scene. You are not locked to full voxel scene, full point cloud scene, you can mix and match, so I think some point cloud for some part, some voxel for some part, some mesh for some part. Uh, that's just an idea that I think it's worth exploring uh, because it will give uh, uh, maybe the ability to play on the strength of each of the data representation uh, because some are well suited for some objects, some not for uh, the other ones, right? Um, and then there is the semantic part uh, in the representation. So here it's, for example, some article that detail object semantic representation. How should you semantically describe objects? So on the right, that was an article with uh, uh, my friend uh, Jean Antoine and also with Roland, where we explored uh, ontologies to better describe or to use ontologies to have classification routines for point cloud data. And what was very interesting is that you could describe, of course, objects uh, formally by having a semantic representation. And then once you have that, you can better deal with every object in your scene. And you have other examples with this very nice article by Armeni AI from Stanford 2019 with the design graph. And another thing is there here again, like the geometric representation, we have the object semantic representation, but we also have the scene semantic representation. And you, I guess, may all be aware about this if you deal with indoor GML or FNCT GML or CTGSON or standards, you know, that plays with things like this. But it's very important uh, for uh, our understanding uh, of the surrounding world or for describing environments. If we want to have, let's say, virtual agents that behave in a human-like manner in our environment, then we really need to focus on having this. And as you can see here, the main element is topology and relationships, which means that we need to have this data structure and the line that allows us to extract the topology and uh, the relationships. So that's uh, also some thing to focus on for the future uh, years. And finally, but that's just for fun, um, I'm on the way of finalizing this point cloud to Lego uh, workflow, where you start with point clouds, and then at the end you have a Lego assembly. Uh, uh, and of course, so you can guess it, uh, at the core of it all is voxels. So that's what is used to down the line, create as uh, assemblies, we, we, which makes it very, very, uh, very fun as well. But that's, uh, um, parallel track um, and I think that's it I see that uh, I'm almost on time and yeah I first want to thank you and you I want to highlight uh, every entity in which I'm involved or let's say the main entities uh, with different aspects uh, as part of teaching and sharing ideas with the three geodata academy and the university of Liège and as part of uh, the more industry related projects and uh, research and technology with Geosat, French Tech and uh, Geovest. So thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope it was clear enough. And now I'm uh, open to questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florent. That was really amazing. Um, really good content. Um, 
and um, yeah, I can see really in the uh, the LinkedIn stream that you have, it's very active, and you know you're really um, going into a lot of detail there. Very comprehensive too. Um, uh, any questions from anyone? We've I know I've got a few Voxel fanatics in the audience, so. Um, I noticed Han clapping his hands, but uh, Sissy, Ben, any questions? Oh, Mudan has his hand up. Uh, hi. Hey. Hi, friends. Uh, it's a good, it's a very nice presentation. And uh, I want to ask a question about the segmentation. Because uh, for the segmentation process, we need to choose optimum parameters for the segmentation. So I want to ask, do you have some certain criteria to evaluate the segmentation performance, like how to assess the reliability of the segmentation results if you change the um, parameters of the segmentation algorithm? Yeah, yeah, it's a very pertinent question. Um, I mean, you have different ways uh, to do that. The best way is, of course, to have uh, training data. So if oh. you have already data that's all of this information, mm -hmm. uh, th 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 then you can infer uh, metrics and know how good your model, your segmentation model will perform. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way to assess. Doesn't mean you need to go in a supervised direction, but for assessing, uh, that's one way to do that. Another way would be to compare to, of course, to benchmark, uh, and that's something we should do in every paper. So benchmarking against existing approaches that are the same. But of mm -hmm. course, for benchmarking, that means you need uh, either to re-implement things or have a data set that already uh, has this information. What what can help you is uh, just recently. Uh, I released uh, a paper in automation in construction with uh, colleagues from uh, VTR Aachen, um, which is targeted to unsupervised segmentation. And we released five data sets uh, with, uh, with instances as well. So we have the, the segment and the instances, it's indoor data sets. And that can be very useful if you want to develop a segmentation algorithm to already have all of this prepared, then you don't need to worry about the data. Uh, so yeah, that, that would be my recommendation uh, to get quicker onto the real fun part, which is trying to solve uh, this uh, this problematic rather than uh, focusing on, on, on the data part, which is essential, of course. So we just need to calculate the number of the segments and see how your algorithm could segment the um, point cloud data into these segments just to calculate the number. Yeah, the, the, there is this uh, metric, uh, the, the sharpness metric as well, which mm -hmm. is introduced, which uh, basically what it does is you look at the boundaries of the objects that you want and you, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you have no uh, under segmentation. Mm -hmm. Over segmentation is usually not such a big problem, but under segmentation is problematic. Uh, okay. So, so that would be the metric to look after to try to uh, improve the sharpness as much as possible, so that respective the border of the object you're considering. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. What did you think, Ben? Yeah, Ben. Um, but very quiet, very quiet. Maybe now it gets better? Uh, yeah, uh, just, yeah, just okay. speak louder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, well, you, you mentioned uh, s several times that, that when you use voxels to process point clouds, that then in fact you only are looking at the surfaces of the objects. And um, but you also mentioned uh, some uh, volumetric reconstruction where you also look at the inside of uh, of objects. And personally, that would be more interesting for me, let's say. I'm, I'm very much interesting, interested in, in using voxels to represent 
well, that every voxel knows which room it belongs to, or what is the distance to somewhere, or the temperature, or that kind of things. Now you provide uh, uh, links to, to your software with data structures inside, and my question would be, is this data structure equally suitable for these volumetric representations as it is for surface representations? Yeah, well, thanks very much, Ben. Very happy to see you uh, virtually. Um, um, yeah, 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 that, that's a very pertinent question. I think the first answer is, yeah, it will, but it will need some tweaking. We we'll certainly need some tweaking. And so, of course, I think, like you, it's one of the greatest uh, potential of voxels, so having this yes. ability to in the volume and not only the surface. Um, and it's still, I mean, you are, you are super active in, into the voxel area, but uh, there are not so much work when we deal with data coming from sensor that, that we have, like a point cloud sensor. Uh -huh. um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't really know uh, how to tackle that rather than this blurry answer because uh, I didn't try it. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't see any counterpoint. It should be so it's implemented in the way it should be able to handle that. But I don't want to say uh, false information. So, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. but to, to be a little bit more precise, uh, okay. Of course, I know that if you want to to represent all the volumes in uh, voxels in a volume, that then the data kind of explodes, or so very soon it it, it gets uh, the, the amount of data gets too big for your computer. Let's say. And actually, I've been working on 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 a on a on a way to 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 solve that. And my question would be: Are we now, let's say, competing, or can we coexist? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, next to each other, or can we cooperate and find a, a common solution? Or what would you be? What is your feeling about these kind of questions? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, super, super interesting, and I think uh, there is a lot of uh, potential for uh, for application and challenges that uh, we are facing at different levels. And you mentioned like temperature estimation, or or even uh, uh, yeah, this idea of mapping the unknown, so trying to go beyond the surface itself, uh -huh. uh, where that would be super interesting to try and combine something to, to, to try and see if it works. But definitely no, there is no competition here because <laughs> most of the most of the work even uh, my PhD students are doing are mainly on the on the point cloud side. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just a big fan of voxel and I want to highlight that. I know you're already corrected, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Jeez, um, Harshit, uh, you got your um, your hand raised. Hi, hello. Hey, man. Yeah, hi. First of all, I'm a very big fan of yours. Very good presentation, and I have followed a lot of your uh, uh, medium profiles and everything. So I have a question regarding: uh, Are there any ways to basically? Uh, provide some semantic enrichment to the point clouds or is it uh, the second part of the question is will it be beneficial for uh, enriching semantic information to the voxels or to the point cloud so my question is related to this semantic enrichment part the where we can feed information externally or to the point clouds so that it could be useful for you in uh, further modeling or extracting more things so thank you Ash, very much for your question. Um, uh, I will try to reframe to be sure I understood correctly. So tell me if uh, it's, it's not that you're searching. So you want to know what is better between point clouds and voxel for semantic injection or is it? Yeah, which way is better and how to do it? Is it doing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, taking things really simply, uh, injecting semantic like the class information, for example, uh, 
Uh, I don't know if you have a field in mind, but I can give you one. If you are in your room and you want to know what is the table, what is the floor, what is the ceiling. So you have three class, floor, ceiling, and table. You could say it's uh, zero, one, and two. And that's basically it. You want to input this pointer to each of the points or each of your voxel. That's the, the, the first layer. The second layer would be, yeah, you, you, you don't want to do, the, to do that per point, but you do you want to do that per segment. So that means you, you put on top a layer of segmentation, and then you will put this label to each segment or each voxel uh, conglomerate. But of course, doing that uh, is very nice because you go much faster. Uh, you can play on more attributes that will uh, link, for example, the proximities or things like this. But it means that if segmentation fails, uh, semantic injection fails or classification fails. Um, that, that, that's really to give you the, the, the base understanding for that. Uh, but yeah. And then after uh, deciding what is better, voxels or, or points, I, I mean, both are, are, are really suited. You will get different results at both levels. Uh, and they are big, strong points. So if your research is interested in deep learning, the good news is you can do and use both structure. Initially, Voxel was the, the main structure. Now, point cloud, you have uh, several architecture that target that, but it will be point-wise. And the Voxel mainly, then you can consider it already as a segmentation step. So you could consider that you have the point level, the Voxel level, that will group several points into Voxel, right? Uh, and, and then another level. So already uh, playing on the voxel, you already in a way make your system uh, prone to failure if your voxelization is not uh, adapted to the point cloud. But on the counterpart, it may be much more efficient because you have more features, you have more information and context information in your voxel structure. Okay, thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I've got a question. The um, so like with when you describe the semantic and the the topology, um, you know, it it's um, much like a, an ontology that you've set up there. Um, you know, so the um, and also I know in um, uh, you know the medical world with you know. Um, genetic research and stuff, that's where there's a big application for ontologies, where you've got millions of nodes and things and looking at their interactions. I also know that voxels are used a lot with medical imaging. Um, are you aware of any stuff in the medical world that uses similar thing, like with voxels and semantic um, markup on those voxels? It's a, it's a very good uh, trick question because I should know <laughs> more about <laughs> it. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I don't have it on top of my head. I, I, I uh, yeah, same as you said, there, there are a lot of really great stuff and they're really active with using voxel representation because we have the volumetric uh, uh, capture. Um, yeah, uh, I'm aware of two works, but I don't remember the author, I don't really remember the names. I don't remember anything really except uh, the papers. Uh, I can forward them to you. Uh, they are pretty interesting the way using semantics. Uh, I don't know what was the end applications, but uh, yeah, it, it triggered my uh, my curiosity at the time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, cheers. I do. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Florent. Thank you very much for for your talk. Uh, very, very interesting. And um, I'm not that much um, a voxel guy, but I understand and I see it every day with my colleagues that I probably should be because that will make my life way easier. Um, but no, now you showed us some um, Python, a lot of Python tools that can handle uh, voxels. So, and I was wondering, have you experimented um, other, other tools in other languages and have you faced some difference in terms of performance? Let's say a simple task, which is like take a huge point cloud and want to voxelize it to a pretty 
good resolution, maybe five centimeter or 2.5 because I saw it in one of your slides. Have you seen any kind of difference in terms of performance with using Python tools and something else like C++, for example? Yeah, hello, Abdullah. So hey. very nice to see you again. You too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, very good question. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I experimented with uh, C++ and Julia. Uh, and Python, uh, and R and MATLAB. Uh, so of course, with R, MATLAB, and Python, Python is the best performances uh, for task like this. Uh, C++, uh, the implementations, don't you, like at Delft, didn't they had an implementation in C++ uh, with voxel-based modeling or something like this? What, sorry, you know? say it again. What did you, uh, what did, you ask? did the University of Delft uh, had Delft. implementation in C++? No, Delft, I'm not sure if we have C++. The only one I know is uh, from the guys in, in my old lab in Lyon. Um, they have this library which is named uh, Digital and which is all about voxels and raster, raster, raster representation, it, which is C++. I haven't tried it. Um, but no, I'm not aware of people in Delft using any C++ script. Uh, CC will, can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm not sure. Ben is not using, Ben is using, um, what was that again? I'm using J. J, okay, yeah, J. Ben is using J. And I have a lot of things in C as well. But, uh... In C, okay, yeah. So, well, I haven't tried. I'm, I'm just curious because I'm a C++ person. And in general, I always try to use C++ tools, but of Python is very convenient. And I, I just want to know basically if there is a big difference or, or not really. I, I didn't make the tests uh, like the, the benchmark. Uh, yeah. Using NumPy because it's all in C down the line. Mm, I don't okay. think you have a massive difference mm -hmm. if you are only using that, depending on how you prepare your, your loop. Else there is a so the Julia, but but I have a big big difference of performances between Julia and Python. I'm I'm like uh, for for tasks that I would handle in Python uh, with Julia, I'm five to ten times faster. Okay, all right. Well, like, so I, I guess, guess the... if you're in C plus plus, you are faster as well. Yeah, I guess the best way for me would be to try. I mean, I was just curious. Maybe you have been through the thing. But, uh, does not PCL as a voxel implementation? Ah, oh, PCL. I, I, it may have. I haven't checked that specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised because Point Cloud obviously now relies a lot on, on voxels. But that's true. That's probably something I can check. Thank you very much. I won't take more of your time, but really good to see you and very nice talk. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions. Um, Sissy, have you? No, have... no, I don't have question. I just wanted to say thank you and uh, uh, very nice uh, systematic presentation. Don't forget about the paper that you promised to yes. publish. It's very important. We are trying to collect uh, really very good high quality papers in one special issue on voxels. So it's very important that you show up there. I will do my best. I'll do my best. I try to uh, to to correct Roland uh, because he had the nice ideas with uh, collinearity and things like this. Uh, but let's see. <laughs> okay, it's going to be interesting. Actually, Mitko uh, has a question. Mitko. Yes, I have one question. Uh, it was very nice to to see you. Uh, I am following your work, uh, and I see that you have a lot of uh, Python presentations and uh, tutorials. I've seen some of them. I'm also a big fan of uh, uh, Python and when it comes to speed, you can speed it up with uh, some other libraries. Like you can use Numba uh, on top of NumPy and speed it up uh, if you want, Abdo. Uh, there are a few more. But my question for you today uh, is about uh, voxelization of uh, 3D models. Uh, 
because we saw today mainly uh, uh, voxels how they are used uh, in relationship to uh, in relationship to point clouds. But I want to see if you have done some work with uh, voxelizations of 3D models, if you have done something uh, related to uh, using uh, semantic data from 3D models uh, for classifications after that, uh, uh, or enriching those like point clouds models with uh, semantic models, uh, semantic data from 3D models and already like Sem uh, semantically labeled 3D models. Have you done such kind of work? Uh, thanks very much, Miko, for the question. Um, did I do such work? I don't think so. Usually, I I have a bottom-up approach. So I start from the point clouds. I take it raw, X, Y, Z, and I try to extract semantics from that. Yeah. Because I, I'm working uh, lately a lot with point clouds. Um, and uh, I'm mainly using Unity, uh, yeah, but now I'm trying to connect Unity and Python. Uh, Unit now as a plugin uh, to use Python directly, uh, and you can uh, visualize more voxels in Unity. Uh, in Python, you can only visualize them using point clouds, which is um, not probably the best way if you have a lot of uh, points. But uh, I'm also working a lot uh, on, uh, on the voxelizations of 3D models, and I, I would really want to to see how or if we can use uh, uh, labeled 3D models and, and uh, voxelize them. Uh, I'm almost like done with uh, one platform on Unity, which can to do voxelization and uh, uh, get the labeled voxels. But I want to see if we can kind of combine with point clouds uh, and see if this can give a bit of a boost in classifications and so on. Yeah, but how I like to see things really is uh, to separate uh, the space uh, from the data. Uh, so you layer to space and then you fill it with data. So if your space define it as cubicle assemblies, so voxels, they are all empty. Then after you fill the space with whichever data you want, and then you will be able to handle whichever element that your data holds within this voxel. And uh, it looks like, um, uh, so, so, so on, on this perspective, uh, having a mesh or a semantic uh, 3D city model or a point cloud makes no difference for extracting the semantics. If you are just in a way of, you already have this information and you just want to transfer it to, to, to voxels. Yeah, I mean, uh, the idea would be because you have labeled uh, data, you have uh, 3D models uh, where you know the semantics for uh, very small pieces of uh, furniture and so on. You can um, uh, get the label correctly when you voxelize the, the, the 3D model. Uh, to use uh, this opportunity that you know the labels perfectly for small pieces and maybe use small voxels and combine it with let's say point clouds and see if this can improve after that when you collect only point clouds the semantics this is what i was thinking but it was very nice to see you and meet you yeah it would be nice if we can do some things together uh, our group uh, we are very uh, interested in voxels. Indeed. Um, yeah, and, and well, Florence um, has very generously uh, suggested um, to do a um, second follow up um, presentation on uh, June 30 um, to uh, to extend some of the uh, the topics, and there certainly is a lot to talk about. So we'd we'd really like to um, welcome you um, to uh, to the, to to present it again, Florent, if that's okay. Um, on June 30. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just have to, uh, some stuff came up. Uh, I just have to, to check the calendar again. Uh, but, okay. Uh, well, great. Okay. Well, yeah, please, yeah, as soon as you can, um, if you can confirm, I'll um, send out an invite to everyone that's in this, um, in this group 
and um, in the meantime, we'll upload this to YouTube and um, um, be able to have a bigger catchment there. So yeah, thank you very much once again. So um, yeah, sure. So everyone, turn off your mics, and we can uh, give you a round of applause. <laughs> I'll uh, stop recording.